Hello and welcome to Four Corners. Tonight, we begin our special three-part investigation into the story of the century, the election of US President Donald Trump and his ties to Russia. Since his inauguration, President Trump has been caught up in a rolling series of allegations. More than a year ago, Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller was appointed to investigate Russian efforts to interfere in the 2016 election and whether Trump or his campaign officials helped them. Also under investigation are Trump's business links with Russia, testing allegations that his deal-making has exposed him to compromise. Over the next few weeks, you'll meet the characters at the centre of this extraordinary saga. We begin by following the spies and the money trail. It starts with a road trip across America in 2014. Before the US presidential campaign was underway, before Donald Trump was a serious candidate, two Russian spies were crisscrossing the country, gathering intelligence on the US political system, looking for and finding vulnerabilities. Two of the defendants allegedly traveled to the United States in 2014 to collect intelligence for their American influence operations. Initially and traditionally, these kinds of operations are very innocent in their overt uh, behavior and appearance. But that was just kind of uh, foundation building, uh, establish a presence, uh, get online. And again, they, for a long time, could, would appear to be innocent. But turns out, after a time, that they weren't. The spies were the forward team from the infamous internet research agency in St. Petersburg, the frontline organization in Vladimir Putin's asymmetrical war against US democracy. For me, I've seen a lot of bad stuff in 50 years in intelligence, but it's very, very disturbing, just viscerally disturbing, that an adversary country was so aggressively meddling in our political process what was different when you say viscerally disturbing? What well, was different? Well, I came to understand the magnitude and the aggressiveness and the, the dimensions of this, uh, it was viscerally, you know, it made me ill. It made you ill? Yeah. Did you share that with your colleagues? Yes. I think it affected all of us that way. The spies left America undetected. The intelligence they gathered would fuel the cyber war in the coming presidential election. The idea, underlying idea of Mr. Putin in my mind was to try to disturb the situation as much as possible, to create different tensions, points of tensions, uh, points of social discontent, of political uh, fighting. So to make, uh, to create turbulence in the st stable society, to make America weak. Uh, the idea of Donald Trump to make America great again. The idea of uh, Vladimir Putin to make American institutions weaker. Do you have any doubt at all about Putin's authorship of the campaign against America? I do not. I have to remember uh, Putin's personal history. Uh, He's a KGB officer, and so I think there's a, an innate uh, resentment uh, and aversion to the United States and what we stand for and our system. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ivanka Trump. Welcome, everybody. Today, I have the honor of introducing a man who needs no introduction. His legend has been built, and his accomplishments are too many to name. That man is my father.
By the time Donald Trump announced his candidacy in 2015, Putin's plans to interfere with the US election were well underway. Wow. Whoa. That is some group of people, thousands. So Even nice. the best informed spy couldn't have anticipated Donald Trump's success. But if you plan to disrupt US politics, here was the perfect gift. Well, you need somebody because politicians are all talk, no action. The Russians are famous for interfering in elections, theirs and other people's. And then when uh, candidate Trump became very viable, particularly when he became the, the Republican nominee, then they were uh, attracted to him because they thought he would be much better for them. Uh, businessman, negotiator, deal maker, someone who had been exposed uh, to Russia. Would Russian intelligence look at Trump's business career as a vulnerability that they could exploit? Well, absolutely. That's kind of standard uh, tradecraft. goes back to the Soviet era. The stock and trade of uh, Russian tradecraft is uh, uh, of some compromising material of some sort, whether real or contrived. I've arrived in Washington to find it in the grip of a sort of madness. A special prosecutor is investigating whether the US president colluded with a foreign power. Whatever else emerges from that extraordinary investigation, Donald Trump's enthusiasm for Vladimir Putin and his refusal to condemn Russia's interference in the election are already on the record. The question that follows is why. Almost everything about Donald Trump is eventually about money. So is the answer to his bizarre attitude towards Putin lying in his business dealings? For decades, Trump and his family had made numerous attempts to launch the Trump brand in Russia. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time in Moscow looking at deals. I've looked at everything from resort to hotel. Russia wanted it, Moscow wanted it. He had always bragged about getting things done in Russia. Do you have a relationship with Vladimir Putin? I do have a relationship, and I can tell you that he's very interested in what we're doing here today. He bragged on a number of occasions of, of being close to Putin when he wasn't, of having access to Putin when he didn't. I suspect during most of that time, uh, people in the Kremlin were filling up small glasses of vodka, clinking it with each other, and laughing at Donald Trump's expense, expense because I think they, they saw him as something of a clown. Tim O'Brien has been covering Donald Trump since the late 80s, including in his 2005 book, Trump Nation. I spent a lot of time with him. We traveled around the country on his jet. I was in all of his homes with him. He and Melania and I went to Palm Beach. Uh, when the book came out, he didn't cotton to it. He didn't feel very good about it. And he ultimately sued me for defamation. I think it's the biggest libel lawsuit in US history. He sued me for $5 billion. Hi, Mom. Trump lost. It was injudicious because he was suing me uh, for financial portions of the book, which in the, in the litigation opened him up to discovery around his finances and his banking records and his business history. So we got his tax returns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is he truthful? No, he's a serial liar. Donald Trump is almost a congenital liar. He can't help himself, in part because He's always creating his own reality. He, he wants the world to believe he is a certain person, and he'll tell any fable or make up any fact to get there. My name's Donald Trump, and I'm the largest real estate developer in New York. I own buildings all over the place, model agencies, the Miss Universe pageant, jetliners, golf courses, casinos, 
and private resorts like Mar-a-Lago. I saw Trump becoming a pop culture phenomenon through just sheer promotion and the willing to put his name on anything that didn't move uh, and a relentless line of promotion about his products, uh, he became the best known billionaire on the earth. And I worked it all out. Donald Trump's longtime associate and sometime advisor, Roger Stone, says Trump's capacity for self-promotion made him irresistible to many. He lived a flashy New York, you know, my way lifestyle that I think people, many people who are aspiring saw not as gaudy or garish, but as, yeah. <laughs> like if I was wealthy, that's how I'd want to live. The plains, the, the Spanish style mansion, the skyscraper with the extraordinary views of Manhattan, the beautiful wife. But Trump's business career has known extravagant success and failure. In the early 1990s, his business empire came close to collapse. You handle it, Matt. He bought an airline. He bought a major hotel. He bought a football team. He expanded his casinos beyond both his ability and the size of the market he was in. Uh, he got overly leveraged on various important real estate properties he was involved with. And suddenly, the piper came calling. Remember the 80s? The yuppies, the buyouts, the junk bonds, and especially the Donald. The man who was the darling of the 80s is seen in the 90s as a man in trouble, and he knows it. Trump found himself on the financial precipice. He had guaranteed personally almost $900 million in loans. He owed some of the biggest banks in the U.S. about $3.6 billion, and he couldn't pay back any of it. Here in New York, Trump's town is where you find the people who've jousted with him for decades and gotten to know the darker side of his deal-making. Attorney Ken McCallion fought Trump for underpaying contractors on the iconic Trump Tower, but his first experience with him was in the 1970s. I knew the Trump Organization um, back when I was a prosecutor. His attorney was Roy Cohen. Roy Cohen went on to become basically a, a mob lawyer, a very good one, but still an organized crime lawyer in New York. And uh, he basically became a mentor for Donald Trump. A series of bankruptcies had made Donald Trump a very unsafe bet. When he had about four bankruptcies, particularly of the New Jersey casinos, a lot of the traditional sources of cash, of investment monies, uh, namely U.S. banks, didn't want anything to do with the Trump organization, with Trump at that particular point. Not for the first time in his checkered career, Trump got lucky. A new source of revenue was flowing into the international real estate market from Russia. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, billions of dollars left Russia. We see this incredible um, capital flight happening at, at this time, and money is going into uh, across the globe, but really a lot of it goes into international capitals, into real estate. All the Trump projects were largely financed, predominantly financed, well over 50% uh, with Russian and former Soviet Union of uh, financial and money cash sources. Donald Trump Jr. famously said, most of the family's assets are, are come in from Russia. I think what he's actually talking about are condominium sales. He's talking about units in these various Trump properties that change hands. And it's important to remember that Hong Kong, London, and New York all in the real estate communities are the center of a lot of this loose money. Some of it's dirty, undoubtedly. Some of it's being laundered, undoubtedly. Do we know whether any of that laundered money ended up in Trump properties? Well, I think the biggest example of this, and I think it's one of the most troubling, is a project that used to be known as the Trump Soho in Lower Manhattan that is alleged in court papers to have been a conduit 
for money being laundered from Eastern Europe and through people who had organized crime backgrounds and people that Trump himself knew to have organized crime backgrounds. And I know he knew because we asked him about it in a deposition in our litigation. So you wanna be the next big Donald Trump used his starring role in The Apprentice to spruik the 2006 launch of Trump Soho. Located in the center of Manhattan's chic artist enclave, the Trump International Hotel and Tower in Soho is the site of my latest development. The first thing you need to know about Trump Soho is it isn't in the chic artist enclave of Soho. It's actually here in Hudson Square, right opposite the entrance to the Holland Tunnel, one of the most congested roadways out of New York. The project was a failure that ended in receivership. Now, Trump's finances are usually obscured in layers of secrecy, but this troubled development gives us a closer look at how the president did business. Trump Soho is a dangerous point for the president because there is so much public information available about his business partners, about where the money came from, and, and about the nature of the project that raised very serious questions about the president's judgment, his ethics, the kind of people he went into business with. One of Trump's principal partners in the Soho project was Felix Sater. Trump and Sata have a long history of business partnerships, which continued well into the presidential campaign. Felix Sata is a career criminal born in the, in the former Soviet Union. He moves to Brighton Beach, Brooklyn with his family. Uh, he ultimately becomes a, a world-class scammer and, and uh, an assault artist. He goes to jail after sticking a broken margarita glass into the face of someone in a bar with whom he had a disagreement. Uh, he gets out of jail and he ends up in a, uh, what we would call in the United States, a boiler room operation. It's a, an investing scam that targets vulnerable or ignorant people. The end of a long drive in the leafy suburbs of Long Island seems a world away from Manhattan. It's home to Trump's notorious partner, Felix Sater. Hello. How are you? How are you, sir? You Come on in. Thank you. Please. Make yourself comfortable. What's it like to be caught up in the way that you are in the story of the century? It feels stranger than anything you could ever imagine. It's just wild. You wake up in the morning, you look in the mirror and say, wow, is this really happening? Sata and his relationship with Trump are central to the allegations of Russian money laundering in Trump real estate. The narrative that's being pushed around right now, that real estate is a way to launder money, uh, possibly, but so is art, yachts, planes, cars, will we shut down all this commerce? Because certain people who do have dirty money and do launder it, do sometimes use those avenues to launder them. We try to sell a product. We try to find our customer. And if at that moment the Russians are good customers, then they're good customers. This whole conversation about Russia, 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 Russia if you really just peel back and look at it, were we trying to sell to Russians? Yes. Were we trying to sell to Brazilians? Yes. Were we trying to sell to people in El Salvador? No. You know why? They don't have as much money. Trump's partner rejects the label career criminal. I was involved in a Wall Street uh, stock fraud. I got into a bar fight, lost my license, uh, didn't have any means of supporting myself, my young child, my wife, or paying for the attorneys to try to fight the case. And I unfortunately made the wrong choice and started doing something wrong. When you ask people who's Felix Sater, they'll say, mob background, uh, glassed a guy with a margarita, um, got involved in stock fraud, that's who he is. 
Well, um, I was 25 years old, and I'm 52 years old right now. I don't understand how somebody could characterize a 52-year-old man by what a 25-year-old kid did. That kid grew up here when his family fled the Soviet Union in the 70s. The southern end of Brooklyn is home to so many Russian emigres, it's known as Little Odessa. The neighborhood is also famous for its concentration of mafia families. Growing up in Brooklyn, there was a lot of, there was a lot of people uh, who were involved, who were mob guys or not mob guys. So you sort of, you sort of knew who they were. And uh, it was the epicenter of, you know, we're talking about Brighton Beach, Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, which is sort of a main place where a lot of them are. He might have grown up here amongst the Mafia and the Russian mob, but after his run-ins with the law, he secretly turned against the gangsters. Investigations in the American media recently revealed that Sater led an extraordinary double life for two decades as an asset for US intelligence and the FBI. I'm trying to tick through in my head the, your potential enemies, Al-Qaeda, Cosa Nostra, Russian mob, Russian criminals, North Koreans. In 20 years, I think I've uh, done a variety of many, many different things with the US government, both with DIA, CIA, FBI, Secret Service. We have laughed at the concept of Like me, you may find this plot yeah. twist hard to believe. He's a Russian gangster. But he's not the Russian gangster. No, no, not even close. Don't just take our word for it. His role as a government asset was described by President Obama's Attorney General Loretta Lynch like this. Felix Sater provided information crucial to national security and the conviction of over 20 individuals, including those responsible for committing massive financial fraud and members of La Cosa Nostra. I assisted them in a significant, uh, in, in significant way in the war against uh, crime in the United States, against, especially organized crime. Against which crime families? All. The full extent of his work for government agencies remains secret, but court documents unsealed this year confirm its scope, stating he relayed specific detailed information to several intelligence agencies passed on specific information about key leaders in Al-Qaeda and affiliated groups, including information that could help the United States locate those individuals. In his own account, one of his first missions was tracking down missing weapons. There was a gigantic fear that Al-Qaeda was trying to buy these Stinger missiles, and with them, they could take out any commercial or military or US government plane. I started identifying Stinger missiles uh, on the market. And then through that, that was my relationship with uh, the CIA. And they started asking for information about bin Laden and uh, his whereabouts. At that time, we're talking about the most sought after information in the world, that is the whereabouts of bin Laden. How do you make a contribution to that? Not only did I contribute to finding his location, I uh, delivered his satellite phone numbers which we used to then listen in on him. And subsequently, uh, President Bill Clinton used the coordinates off those satellite phone numbers to hone in and authorize the bombing of his camps in, uh, I believe it was 98. For the most part, I couldn't tell anybody. Um, and it was very, very sensitive work. So for the most part, I kept it to myself. And it was an interesting life. I was uh, literally building Trump Towers by day and hunting bin Laden by night. Sata is cautious about how much of this remarkable saga he shared with his business partner. But Donald Trump did reveal some knowledge of it in a video deposition. I don't think he was connected to the mafia. He got into a barroom fight and uh, 
In fact, he was supposedly very close to the government of the United States as a witness or something. He did know that you were working for the government because I think he mentioned that in one of the depositions. So he knew that much about you. Uh, he may have. I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact details, but he may but have. I may have said, I may have generally said something, but I was never specific on anything that I did. Felix Sater argues that in, in some ways this was uh, expiation for his sins and that he was a reformed man from that point. Do you buy that? Uh, I think Felix would say anything he needs to in the moment to spin the person he's talking to and make him seem more important than he really is. In that regard, he's Donald Trump's twin. The government seems to think that I've paid my debt. The judges seem to think that I've paid my debt. The Justice Department think, seem to think that I've paid my debt. They seem to think that I've paid more than my debt, that I've gone above and over. Felix Sater first ventured into the New York real estate business in 2000. He joined a property development company called Bayrock and set up offices in Trump Tower two floors below Donald Trump. Once we were there, I decided to stop and knock on his door and tell him that we should start doing business together. And how did he respond? He laughed because I walked in and told him I'm gonna be the biggest developer in New York City and you should get in early now while, you know, before it's too late. And he laughed and introduced me to some other members of the staff. Felix and, and his other partners at Bayrock end up going out of the town with Donald Trump Jr. and Ivanka. Felix ends up escorting Donald Trump Jr. and Ivanka around Moscow as the Trumps look for potential deals there. Why Moscow? What's the appeal of Moscow? Oh, like any other capital, wealthy place with people who can afford to buy units at a very good price and we could make money and have a beautiful building. Sater's timing was good. He arrived with Russian connections exactly when Donald Trump was targeting Russian customers for his US real estate ventures. They had very close Russian connections through Sater, through Sater's partners in Bayrock. Uh, and um, it not only, uh, a lot of the Russian, when I say Russian, former Soviet Union money, uh, went um, not only in buying some apartments, uh, and units in Trump Soho, but also went to the, uh, directly into the organization itself. Over the years, we know with, with Trump Soho, they marketed directly to the Russian consumers, consumers uh, from the post-Soviet states that had a, a lot of cash on hand. They provided a means to circumvent traditional banks because these are consumers who don't need mortgages, who don't need to go through bank checks. They show up with a lot of cash, millions of dollars, and they, they, they purchase the unit. There was a very sophisticated program of marketing to Russians. Obviously, there's a lot of money in the... Not true. Not true. Brochures are pretty posh. They're very posh, but we were just as sophisticated about marketing to South America. They end up pursuing three deals together, a, a, a real estate project in Phoenix that fails, a project in Florida that fails, and then ultimately the Trump Soho in Manhattan, which opens to great fanfare, but also ultimately fails. Why did Bayrock keep having so much money pour into it when all the projects it, were, it was touching were failing? And there's sort of a classic warning signal when, when law enforcement investigators are looking at a business that is cash rich, but the businesses themselves keep failing as to whether or not that business is trying to turn itself into a washing machine for dirty money. Specific allegations against Bayrock and the Trump Soho project were made by a former executive in the company. Sater and Bayrock's founder, a Soviet-born Kazakh named Tevkif Arif, were both sued. Felix Sater's own partner, a man named Jody Chris, whom I've interviewed, who also sued Sater, has alleged in court filings that, in fact, that's what Bayrock was. It was a, it was a pure money laundering operation that uh, Felix and his other partners in the business were skimming money. It's alleged in court papers that uh, a big chunk of the money came in from Kazakhstan, uh, former Soviet Union, from a chromium plant that was being run by the brother of one of the principals at Bayrock. And that essentially money was getting stripped out of the chromium plant in Kazakhstan and whoosh, 
flown into these failing projects in the United States. And whoosh, does Donald Trump know about it? Uh, I think those are some of the questions that, that Bob Mueller is going to ask Donald Trump about. It's clear that this is now part of Mueller's investigation. The allegations made by Jody Chris in relation to the use of laundered money in Bayrock, is there any justification, any truth um, in that? No, that was a extortion. And it was an eight-year legal extortion using stolen documents, which had nothing to do with money laundering whatsoever. All of the cases were thrown out of court. But uh, as you know, the US legal system is interesting, and you could sue anybody for anything. And it was a straight up extortion. Am I right in saying it was settled in the end? Um, unfortunately, yes, not by me. I had to settle, but it wasn't my choice. As Trump Soho was preparing to launch, the New York Times broke the story of Sater's criminal past, the barroom violence, and the mafia backed stock fraud. Sater had become an embarrassment to Donald Trump. Why didn't you go to Felix Sater and say, you're connected with the Mafia, you're fired? Well, first of all, we were not the developer there. That was a licensing deal. Much but your name's on it, Mr. Trump. Excuse me, but I don't know. You're telling me things that I don't even know about. I mean... Sater had to leave Bayrock, but Trump's sensitivity to questions about him never went away, including this encounter with the BBC. Uh, but, but for a year, you stayed in bed with Felix Sater, and he was connected with the Mafia. Again, John, maybe you're thick, but when you have a signed contract, you can't, in this country, just break it. And by the way, John, I hate to do this, but I do have that big group of people waiting, so I have to OK, leave. no, hold on. One last question, please, sir. I have to leave. Um, Thank you. After two years in Moscow, Sater was back at Trump Tower, this time working directly for Donald Trump with an office and a Trump Organization business card. I stepped up to say hello to Mr. Trump, and he asked me to come on board and uh, made me a senior advisor. Despite their renewed partnership, Donald Trump continued to deny knowing Felix Sater. In 2013, investors who'd lost money in Trump's Florida project took Trump to court. Their lawyers wanted to know about his relationship with Felix Sater. I do. About how many times have you have you conversed with Mr. Sater? In, in, over the years? Over the years, if you could ask. Not many. Not many. If he were sitting in the room right now, I, I really wouldn't know what he looked like. Okay. Why does Donald Trump say at certain points in his career that he doesn't know you when he does? You should ask him. Sure, but there are certain times when you've gone a little bit further, which is to acknowledge that it has been somewhat painful for you, that it has been painful for you for him to do that. Yes. So it does cause you discomfort? No, it's uncomfortable. I agree with it. I don't think Donald Trump wants to admit what he actually knows about Felix Sater, which is that Felix Sater had a mob background. And, and, a, and, a, and a troubled legal history, because it then raises the question of why Donald Trump, as a business person, would get into bed with partners like that. And I think the answer to why he does is that if you've got a big enough bag of cash and you plant it on Donald Trump's desk, he'll do business with you, no questions asked. Despite the maestro's aggressive spruiking, Trump Soho was a financial disaster. It was foreclosed on in 2014. The Trump name was recently removed from the building's facade. But the facade around the Trump's financing of the deal seems destined for the scrutiny of a grand jury. It's clear that this is now part of Mueller's investigation. Uh, I think the reason behind that is there's a clear issue as to whether or not Donald Trump had financial quid pro quos where in his business past, he did favors or had relationships for people that were tied into foreign powers who might benefit from Trump making policy changes, like, for example, lifting economic sanctions once he became president. The failure of Trump Soho and the exposure of Felix Sater's past criminal activities 
were not enough for Trump to sever his connections. Like Forrest Gump, Felix Sater keeps popping up in all these strange ways in, in, in different uh, places of Trumplandia, including until very recently. Mr. Cohen, why do you think they raided your uh, office in the hotel room? Have you talked to Mr. Trump? Trump's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, is a pivotal player in Trump land. Michael Cohen and Felix Sater are childhood friends. He was a teenager, you know, he was a good guy, and I don't know, it was like every one of my other friends. But we were all pretty uh, um, aggressive and ambitious. Cohn is not the smoothest political operator you've ever met, and he has a fondness for organized crime metaphors and sounding like a thug, uh, and he likes to threaten people. In 2015, when Donald Trump was a candidate for president, Trump, Sater, and Cohen were working together on a plan to build a Trump Tower in Moscow. Putin hates us. He hates Obama. He doesn't hate us. I think he'd like me. I'd get along great with him, I think. Want to know the truth. This is October of 2015. The, uh, uh, the debates are beginning. It's the run-up to, uh, uh, to the primary. Everybody has been baffled at this point, or many people in the press have been baffled by why Donald Trump keeps saying nice things about Vladimir Putin. Uh, he's a repressive dictator. What is this strange infatuation that Trump has for Putin? Nobody could figure it out, but it is worth knowing, <laughs> which nobody did at the time, that Trump was trying to do a business deal in Russia, and you needed Putin's approval. So how enthusiastic was Donald Trump about the project? You'll have to ask Donald Trump, because I didn't mm. speak to him about it directly. But you must, have got a, you must have got a read from Michael Cohen, otherwise you wouldn't, you wouldn't put your reputation on the line to start picking up the phone and making the calls if you didn't think you had his buy-in. Oh, I knew I had the buy-in. I spoke to Michael, he said, let's go. That was it, that's all it takes. We do know that Trump, as a candidate, signed a letter of intent on the Moscow project, indicating he had knowledge there was something that was going to be done in Moscow. He had knowledge of who the people on his side of the deal were. Sata and Cohen's emails about the Moscow proposal are freighted with excitement. Dear Michael, please have Mr. Trump countersigned, signed, and sent back. Let's make this happen and build a Trump Moscow, and possibly fix relations between the two countries. That should be Putin's message as well, and we will help make him agree on that message. Sincerely, Felix Sater. Trump's previous attempts to build in Moscow had failed. Because of the campaign, obviously, he was very well known worldwide, and I thought that that would put it over the, over the top. In November, Sater emailed Cohen. Michael, buddy, our boy can become president of the USA and we can engineer it. I will get all of Putin's team to buy in on this. A needed support and approval in Russia by the mayor as well as all the way up to Vladimir Putin. Um, so there was a um, important component of needing to get his buy-in to get this building built and financed because it had to be financed by local Russian banks. Sater's most audacious move was to propose a joint event in Moscow with Putin and Trump during the campaign. We were hoping that he would go for the ribbon cutting of the project and we would try to get both him and Putin on stage for the ribbon cutting, which, you know, we hoped that, yes, they would go off and start negotiating peace in our time. In July 2016, 
the most unlikely presidential candidate secured the Republican nomination. As his links with Russia became a controversial topic of the campaign, the prospect of a business deal with Putin evaporated. But zero, I mean, I will tell you right now, zero, I have nothing to do with Russia. Questions about collusion with Russia have swirled around Trump ever since. His long winter of discontent continued through spring with a steady drip of allegations and a widening investigation by the special prosecutor into the business affairs of the Trump organization. Among the dozens of questions, Mueller now wants to put to the president, what dealings did he have about the Moscow project during the campaign? Have you spoken to Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller? No comment. Do you believe that Trump or his close associates colluded with the Russians? Absolutely not. Why are you so sure? Because I don't believe that uh, Donald Trump would collude with a foreign power to the detriment of ours. Do you think that Mr. Trump is vulnerable in terms of his business history and well, Mueller's the investigation? Point is, I mean, as Alan Dershowitz has written, the average American commits three felonies, maybe five felonies a day inadvertently. Uh, the awesome power of an unbridled federal prosecutor who doesn't have to just look at Russian collusion, but can look at every molecule of your being, your business, your... Uh, it, it's, it's, it's chilling. The Russian collusion delusion is the greatest political dirty trick of all. It's a hoax. It's a fairy tale. Russians clearly were interested in penetrating uh, the Trump campaign. I really heard a different person. It was not George anymore. It was scared to death. I think Vladimir Putin realizes he could inject this virus into our political system and set us fighting against each other. It's similar to the Salem witch trials many centuries ago. In every way, it's a witch hunt.